there are always other bands who would say, man, this sounds shit and this yeah. is not good. And they will always criticize. So that it's like that. For example, I remember when Europe came up with Final Countdown, which went to, uh, I mean, which became a huge hit all over the world. Right. And everybody criticized, saying that, oh my God, they look like women. Oh, they have po their poses and, you know, they got hairspray, they got makeup. And I mean, they didn't give a shit about it. So, I mean, like they had a lot of success, huge success. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of my podcast. We have a very special guest today, all the way from Sweden. We have Mr. Chit. Tral Chitti Somapala. Hi Chitti. Hi, good morning everyone. How are you doing? Not too bad, man. Existing for the sake of existence, I would say. <laughs> so, uh, how is the situation over there? Because I remember Sweden didn't have any lockdowns or anything, right? With yes. COVID? Yeah, right at the moment. Uh, I mean, like from the very beginning of COVID-19, uh, Sweden never locked down and um, well, there are certain countries around us, uh, they're blaming us saying that uh, we should have locked down. Right. Because, uh, most of these countries were saying things about uh, Sweden. I mean, they made Bell looked after the whole thing. So, I mean, there are a few cases here and there and you get to know, but mm. uh, still, they're under control, I would say so. Yeah. So, I mean, they were they were focusing on like having the herd men, herd uh, immunity, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, let's see how everything works. But uh, right at the moment, there is no live entertainment. Uh, uh, nothing is happening at the moment. Right. But uh, they have started. Uh, Few very, I'm um, there starting gradually uh, with very less people, uh, not in in the mass gatherings though. Right. Well, I'll be performing on the 22nd, a gig uh, only for about 50 people. Right. So things are starting gradually, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I that show that that show was already sold out, right? <laughs> Yes, uh, I mean, like it was announced and it was like a couple of hours later, it's been sold out. Okay, of course, to people, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, because people are so eager to go go and see live shows, right? Because there's nothing yes. happening, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. So, Ch Chitty, when did you went to Sri Lanka last time? Uh, the last time I was in Sri Lanka was, well, I was here in Sweden. On the 6th of February, I left to Colombo for a week. Then I went to Australia and New Zealand with the Marians and I did four concerts and uh, so I came back to Colombo on the 15th and from the 17th onwards, uh, I got locked down in, uh, in Colombo in Sri Lanka okay. because they cut down the airports and uh, so I was there for about almost three months. So somehow I managed to get a flight to Stockholm because Qatar, uh, they were operating their flights regularly right. and uh, so I came back like uh, two months ago right so Chitty I'm uh, I'm from Sri Lanka I moved here like 15 years ago wow. and uh, I remember I clearly remember you uh, from TV mostly from ITN because you played with friends you know yeah. you had your hairspray and uh, <laughs> that was, yeah that was that was uh, Basically, that was in the 80s, 90s, early 90s. Right. So that was uh, like, I'm, well, I'm not a person who follow the trend always, but uh, that was a kind of thing because uh, I used to play bass. Right. So I never wanted my hair falling over in front of my face so where I could not see my fretboard. So that's right. the reason I used to put my hair all the way up there. <laughs> So that's how it worked, everything. So finally it worked. And a uh, lot of people, they appreciated my hairstyle then. Yes, yes. Because you guys are very uh, frequent on like music showcase or fan club, those those shows, right? 
uh, right. you guys, Apple Green, and then there was like Shohan and the Experiment, all these bands, right? The Purple uh, Rain, and yeah. uh, I mean, well, I would say it's sad, but I, I'm a very, I'm a uh, frequent visitor to Sri Lanka because uh, on behalf of music, and uh, when I compare the Colombo, I mean, I come from Colombo, so basically Colombo was a uh, was the place where everything was happening, right. and Colombo has become a very commercial city right now, right at the moment. But uh, those days, I remember early '80s to uh, end of '90s, we had vast amount of clubs where they had a lot of live music and a uh, lot of bands. They used to play various styles of music but right at the moment uh things have faded away and um, i i hope it will come up mm. quite soon but i don't know how is it how is it in philippines you live in philippines for the last 15 years uh same thing so uh, we have like you know all these different places for clubs for you know electronic music and club music and then there's a lot of metal and rock uh right now the situation is the same so everything is stopped <laughs> uh -huh. everything is stopped because we actually have like uh, around 100,000 cases of covid here in the philippines oh, wow. so every we are kind of in a lockdown um, you know i've been working from home for last six months, last three months or three, three and a half months. So yeah, that's the situation. Um, yeah. So, uh, so Chiti, I, uh, I mean, I know that your, 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 your parents were very well renowned uh, musicians in Sri Lanka, uh, mm -hmm. your mother and father. Uh, but can you tell me a little bit about growing up? I know that you, your, uh, first sort of you were not really into music as first you were like into cricket first <laughs> mm -hmm. well I was more into sports than music because right. uh, I grew up in that surrounding where music was made music was composed and my mom was a singer my father was a composer for various artists and then uh, also he did uh, compose uh, for about 49 Sri Lankan movies music you provided and uh, so well when i did see how musicians were addicted to certain things like uh, they were drinking alcohol they were smoking different different things so well my, my, my dad he did not do anything like that but uh, unfortunately he passed away from cancer uh, mm -hmm. that was in 19 um, no when he was 69 years old that was 1991 and uh, so I really disliked doing music and my parents being musicians because uh, my dad was a controller of music at the one and only Sri Lankan Broadcasting Corporation and uh, his advice was for us like uh, uh, you have to have something in your background that means some certain qualifications if you want to do music uh, as only a hobby right uh, so I don't know I was into sports a lot I was an addicted sportsman and uh, come on I, I just with my friends I was moving around with all my friends and they were kind of they were kind of joking and saying things to me and just giving me a guitar and say that okay man you could do that just do it well it worked so I continued that path. So that was it. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your parents were quite open-minded, right? They were open to the Western music and, uh, right? So mm -hmm. when you took up, uh, like, you know, playing Western pop songs, uh, they were supportive of it? Yes, but uh, the thing is, uh, my mom was a Catholic. And she went to St. Bridget's Convent and she used to be in a choir. Right. And uh, so even my dad, I'm like, I mean, a lot of people are criticizing about it, saying that my father had a lot of Western influences in his music. I mean, the early composers like Sunil Shanta, my father, 
then H.T. Chandrasena and Ananda Samarakon, they were all Western influenced musicians, I would say, so composers. Right. So they had uh, that, uh, those elements in their music and there was a huge critic going on, criticizing my dad, saying that uh, uh, that was a wrong thing to bring in brass instruments like trumpets, trombones, and also woodwinds, for example, like clarinets and the Western flutes. So Sri Lanka was a British colony. So we had a lot of people with that influence around the whole island, I would say. And uh, so my father, he did, uh, he was going on the right path with the right direction, with the right essence at the same, at the same time. So, well, you know, uh, it, I mean, even in metal, a band comes up with a good album and there are always other bands who would say, man, this sounds shit and this right. is not good. And they will always criticize. So that it's like that. For example, I remember when Europe came up with Final Countdown, which went to, uh, I mean, which became a huge hit all over the world. Right. And everybody criticized, saying that, oh my God, they look like women, oh, they have po they're posers, and you know, they got hairspray, they got makeup, and I mean, they didn't give a shit about it. So I mean, like, they had a lot of success, huge success. So uh, even myself, uh, I was criticizing them as well because I didn't like that city sound, you know, the intro and everything. But <laughs> later on, I mean, like, uh, I, I still remember I went to a, a music store somewhere, I walked into a music store, I bought the CD. I was playing the whole thing. I was really thinking to myself, oh, wow, there's something going on there. Just one bubblegum hit, but the rest of it is really great. Right. So uh, that's how everything goes. huh? <laughs> So what were the bands that you were listening to, like rock bands back then? Well, Channa, uh, uh, I uh, actually, uh, I'm a very old fashioned musician. Right. Uh, I started listening to bands like Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Uriah Heep, Emerson Lake and Palmer. I mean, Emerson Lake and Palmer, that time it was, it's like techno music. Like it was a lot of synth sounds on it. Right. So uh, then, uh, well, I would say like classic rock. So I hope you remember uh, that was in the 70s and then beginning of the 80s era, bands like White Snake and everyone, they became more mainstream blues rock oriented metal. Right. So basically hard rock became metal because uh, the media was pushing them towards the metal side, like magazines like Metal Hammer, Rock Hard, um, uh, Rolling Stone, and etc. So I was following that path, but uh, I always wanted to have that Ronnie James Dio feel of my vocals. I never wanted to have that clean type of uh, 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 high pitched uh, uh, vocal sound in myself. In myself, so. So I remained the same. And then I was playing a pop band as a bass player and a singer. So I was doing all those various types of mainstream rock music, like uh, for example, like uh, uh, Brian Adams, mm. even Guns N' Roses. I, I, I don't like the band so much, but uh, I had to do because they were commercial. Right. Scorpion was one of my greatest influences because in the beginning, Scorpion was really, really, really unstill. Whatever they do, uh, there is a meaning to it. So, uh, I mean, they're veterans. They know exactly what they're doing. They're not going out of their box. They go maybe about a few meters away, but they still come back, you know. <laughs> right. So in that case, so that's how I got influenced uh, towards uh, hard rock music. Then in the, in the meantime, I was listening also to singer-songwriter type of things like uh, Lou Reed, then um, Neil Young, 
Bob Dylan, not that much, but uh, uh, like a new wave of British rock, for an example, like the Police, um, Stranglers, Madness, and many, many things. And uh, so now I have made my own stand. So I need to find a distributor to send it out. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, what was the first first band that you uh, start playing? Yes, um, I was playing with. Uh, I played with uh, uh, in 1984. I started my career. Then I got the chance to get out of Sri Lanka in 1986 because uh, I've been jamming and playing around in the Colombo nightclub era area, and then I used to go down south because of the heavy tourism traffic that time in our yeah. country. And uh, I played in, uh, I played also with Dilip Gabadamogli. We were doing that, uh, his own composition. So that was a very good thing for me, uh, that Dilip thing happened because uh, I was, I had the full, full freedom uh, to improvise and get my own voicings on my bass line. So that was really great and I learned a lot from his uh, uh, skills, mm. how to compose music, how to arrange, how to arrange uh, the whole song. So this was a great experience. I'm really thankful for that. And uh, then I used to play in a couple of pop bands, but uh, when I got this offer in 1986 to go out of Sri Lanka with Rendezvous, I thought to myself, and actually my mom was really supporting me a lot. And she said like, uh, save some money and go and just do your thing. And uh, whenever you get a lot of experience, then start doing whatever you want to do. Right. And my father has been all the time uh, saying the same thing. He said like, uh, I said, yeah, I, I'd like to have a band like uh, with one singer, one bass player, one guitarist and a very heavy drummer. I always wanted to have that heaven and hell type type of vibe from Black Sabbath. Right. And uh, my dad said, it's not possible in Sri Lanka because you have to be very commercial to succeed here. So somehow uh, I managed this then in 1994, uh, uh, 96, I, I, uh, I joined Rendezvous in 1997. In 1987, we disbanded, then I joined the band Friends. I was with them for some time, like till about 1994. Mm. I got really sick of playing all these commercial nightclub stuff. And uh, so then I joined uh, a German underground band called Code Just. I was offered to join them. And the first album with them uh, became a huge critical point in the German heavy metal scene uh, and uh, people started talking about me, about this colored singer sounding like and acting like Ronnie James Dio. In some of the reviews, it was written, uh, if Ronnie James Dio would have had a son, that means he's born in Sri Lanka. I still have those paper cuttings with me. And uh, so somehow like, uh, I mean, it was a talk of the town. So people started contacting me for auditions and asking me for demos and so on. And uh, I managed it, so here I am. <laughs> so e even before you told me that story, when yeah. I was listening to this album of Dio, the last yeah. in line, yeah. uh, I, could, I could imagine you singing that song. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a few underground demos, but we still did with Code Jester, which was not used at the end uh, in the record, because the record label itself, they said, like, uh, uh, keep your own identity, because uh, 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 don't try to be, uh, we don't need a copy, of a, a, copy of, a copy of Ronnie James Dio here. So that was very strange and funny. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Actually, right at the moment, I'm, uh, I have a new project in Sweden with a uh, former bass player of Hammerfall, Magnus Rosen, together. 
Right. And uh, we played uh, in Sri Lanka last year in September at the Rock Meets Reggae concert with, with our new formation, The Sign. And then when I went to Palambo, I played some of these old demos to Magnus, Magnus said, man, this sounds like a copy of Dio. You know? <laughs> so in a way, it's good that we did not use them, but I still got those things. And also, you must be knowing Manoa. And uh, with the former guitar player, David Schenkel, I also, David Schenkel group, uh, we, ha we had a project together, David Schenkel group, he recruited, recruited me as a singer. Right. But, uh, well, nothing happened with that. That was, we just recorded a few, uh, a few of his uh, demos. Even on that, I sound a lot like Dio. I don't know, I did not do it purposely. But I, somehow I have that raw character. So, which is, uh, I'm very happy about that. Because uh, I don't sound like anybody else. I sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever got a chance to see Dio? Well, I did see Dio once or twice, but we never got the option to tour with them. And, um, but I have toured with, uh, uh, when I was in court, just we have supported uh, a few big bands as a support, like for an example, German bands like Chroming Rose, then Scanner and, um, um, I can't remember, but that time they were quite huge in that scene. And uh, then when I was with Avalon, we toured with Uriah Heep, we uh, played with Hammerfall, we played with Ed Guy, we played with, uh, even with Metallica on the same stage at the Gods of Metal Festival, that was in 1999, right. with King Diamond and uh, with Metallium. I mean, those were bands, they were, quite trendy but uh, <clears throat> the weird question people are asking me like uh, uh, have you ever been in the charts I mean tell me which metal band have been in the charts <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's not music for the charts right. <clears throat> it's for true listeners so I've done uh, up to now I've done about 35 albums with various projects and everything and uh, well they are not trendy albums though but uh, musically there is a big value into it and uh, I'm glad and I'm very proud that I'm also listed with certain great names in the industry in right. those albums so that's how my name is somehow it's somehow there in that scene. <laughs> yeah, you know this website, uh, Encyclopedia of Met Metal? Yes. Yeah, so are you, uh, you have a very good profile there with all the, you know, all these <laughs> albums and uh, lineups. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've, re I've recorded several albums. Actually, it was a, a tip from a friend of mine, uh, uh, Daniel Flores. He used to play in a band called... Uh, I can't remember, it was a Swedish progressive metal band. I said, Daniel, uh, you're on every record. Uh, and people may say that you have bad reputation, you're going from that to that and this to this and this, and you should stay in one band. He said, no, 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 Chidi. You know what? He is from Chile. And uh, he said, do as much as you can. When you have a lot of albums in your discography, people will look at you more right. and which is right which is really true and uh, so i'm proud that i have done so many different things because it's a great experience at the end channel yes i mean there are a few i mean some of my friends they they, they stick to they stick into one band for uh, they're together for about 25 years and they have done about five albums and, uh, and they say the same thing to me. Uh, well, I should have done more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm happy. I started my metal career in 1995. And up to now, I've gone to about 35 to 36 albums. I was also featured on Vivaldi Metal Project. Uh, 
I mean, it was also with uh, loads of well-known uh, metal singers as well and metal uh, musicians as well. So I was featured on one song, and uh, but that song was well reviewed, and uh, so that's how it goes. So Chitty, can you tell me about this band Avalon? Because I know the the band was produced by the producer, even produced Halloween and by Blind Guardian and all these bands as well, right? Yes. So how did you join Avalon? How that happened? Uh, that happened was uh, uh, in 1998, uh, called Jester was disbanded. As I said to you, when this first album came out, A Force to Believe, and the talk of the town was me. So somehow LMP Limp Music Products, who was a record label of Rhapsody hmm. and various, various things. And actually, uh, Lim Snow is the manager of a record label and uh, the Hello in the Pumpkin was his idea and was his design and he was a manager of Halloween right at the beginning. Right. And um, I, uh, like I said to you, I was touring with Scanner, with Cogesta mm. and uh, they had a singer, Sheridan, somebody and uh, then the band leader, he asked me, uh, he, he took me to a corner. He said, like, would you like to join Scanner? I was like, wow. I did not say this to anyone. I kept it to myself. And uh, then again, I, I discussed a lot of things. I said, like, listen, I have a mid-range. I sing with a lot of power and energy, but I don't sing that high. He said, no, no, no. I'm going to write the new stuff. If you're going to join us, I'm going to present you with my new material. I'm going to write that material, write uh, this material in a specific range where you are comfortable with. I said, okay. So I was waiting for this offer at home and I'm getting a call from, from Hamburg, LMP, Limp uh, Music Products, saying that Avalon is looking for a singer. And I was also auditioned by, uh, through him for Axel Rudi Pell, the German gu uh, famous guitar player. Right. And, uh, but that time, uh, Axel said to me, straight to my face, uh, you're a great singer, but, but I need to have a, uh, I need uh, your voice to be more mature. I still feel that you're like, uh, you're 25, you know? <laughs> <laughs> He was looking for a voice like 35, 36, somewhere around that. So he said, wish you good luck. So I accepted that. And uh, so I was waiting for this. And then uh, uh, Lim called me and he said, like, Avalon is looking for a singer because they're going to produce this record with Charlie Bowerfine, the former producer of Halloween, Blind Guardian, blah, blah. I was like, man. <laughs> that was what an excitement that was because Blind Guardian, you know, they are really on the top, and Charlie Bowerfine, the name is all over the world. Right. So I said, okay. So then those guys, they contacted me, and um, so I went by train from the place where I used to live in Germany. I went uh, to Munich. It was about a five hour train ride. And they said, let's meet in the studio, let's jam, and let's. So Charlie was there. And Charlie's a very critical guy. I thought, uh, well, a man coming with this sort of color and this sort of influence. Well, straight away after five minutes, he said, man, you're in it. You know what? Go home and uh, come in about a week. We'll prepare everything. Mm. We'll get drums sorted, we'll get bass sorted, and we'll get all the rhythm tracks and everything tracks are ready. Then you can come and do uh, the voicings. So I came, uh, I was able to finish all the vocals in, in eight days. So we sang about, I finished about 12 songs in eight days. He didn't push me that hard to do, do it, do it, do it, do it. He just said, just feel comfortable and just do it because I don't want to ruin your voice. So. That's how I joined Avalon. And uh, 
that was the, the album Vision Eden was produced in 1988. Mm. Then in 1999, uh, we became uh, the best newcomer band in France, uh, in the rock magazine, and then in Italy, also in Holland. In Holland, we opened for Annihilator, and we also played with Group Incorporated, and uh, I cannot remember, but it used to be on so many festivals. And that was really, really great experience. Right. And meet different, different people and get different contexts is a must. So 1999, that was it. So then we decided to do the third album, Eurasia, yeah. uh, with Charlie Baufine. And Charlie was kind of busy with Saxon. And he said, like, I don't want you guys to wait. So the best is, please contact Sasha Peth. Yeah. Uh, who's, who did Avantasia and Rhapsody and Heaven's Gate and etc. So we recorded the Eurasia with Sasha Peth and then we announced, okay, that we did one complete tour for about six weeks with Metallion all over Europe. And uh, so like everybody was kind of, uh, they were not happy doing progressive metal music. And my job was like uh, two and a half minutes singing and they play like five minutes instrumental. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking it's better when I go my own way, finding my own thing mm. with, uh, well, uh, you don't need to play songs like 300 kilometers per beat. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, <clears throat> find more of a songwriter type of thing so so that's how it everything happened things changed after 2000 after the millennium so your <clears throat> the avalon album eurasia i was actually listening to that uh, like very recently so you actually have sri lankan uh, you know rhythms and stuff there right Some... yes i brought in few few things because uh, uh, we didn't want to overproduce with that uh, because Sasha, uh, he advised us uh, not to put too much into it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like always listening to, even though you can be a professional, you can be anybody, you could have uh, tons of experience. But uh, the guy who is producing the record, you have to respect him and you have to accept his view. And uh, so we did it that, uh, we did under his influence, which was really good. He said, just use it as a small essence here and there. That's much more than enough. <laughs> and right. don't lose your metal factor. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so uh, after that, you met this guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, that's a long story. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, Avalon uh, albums were distributed in the U.S by David T. Chastain. Do you remember this guitar player? No. Who, who's, who is that? David Chastain. Uh, he was, I, I cannot remember the record label. He used to have a, a distribution company in the US. He, he recorded various solo albums like Ibi Malmsteen oh. in that era. And uh, so Chastain used to distribute Avalon uh, in the US. And then, uh, like I said, in 2000, we disbanded Avalon and uh, then I record, I formed my own thing together with uh, 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 Frank Rollers. He's a guitar player who used to play in a Queen tribute band because I, I have been a big fan of Queen as well. Right. So we want to do that sort of, but not exactly the same. But I said, I want to do more melodic rock type of thing. So somehow we did that project. That project got signed by MTM Records, and which was a quite huge label that time. So uh, I did two albums with them. And then I did that, and uh, we got a lot of radio airplay and everything all over in Germany, everywhere. And uh, I was waiting at, I was waiting home and then 
David Chastain contacted me, sent me an email. Chitty, Five Indy is looking for a singer. Should I give your contact? Mm -hmm. So I gave, I said, yes, why not? Yeah. And then I checked Gus, uh, Gus, Gus's uh, stuff with Five Indy. That's my thing, okay? So he contacted me from, yeah, from Greece. And then he said like, uh, well, I need to listen to your songs with our music. So will you be able to record? I said, of course. So I recorded two demos, I sent to him and everything was confirmed for the Japan tour. So we did this uh, successful Japanese tour with him. Uh, at that time, he was the only member, Every, everyone else was hired. Right. So then he asked me to join the band permanently. And myself and Stian, the Norwegian drummer, and uh, Bob and uh, Pietro. So that's how we, everything came up. We did, we did record, uh, uh, and he wanted me to write some of the songs with him together. So we did this album, Forged by Fire, which was uh, on the Century Media and distributed by Century Media. And then we toured with Hammerfall and uh, we played some big, big festivals with Gamma Ray and many bands. So, 2006, I left the band. <laughs> <laughs> Myself and Stian, we left the band because Gus, for him, uh, I mean, it was not enough. He, wa he was expecting more success with it. And then he said, he was uh, telling us, ah, I've got an offer from Arch Enemy to play at the Ozfest and so on. Right. So, what I had to say is, okay, just go and do it and I'll fall off. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I left. And myself and Stian, we left the band because of that reason. Yeah, but I, I really like the songs you did in that album, huh? Forged by Fire. Yeah, thank you. There's this uh, one video on YouTube that you guys put, Tyranny? Tyranny, yes. Yeah. Actually, it was, it was played on MTV in Europe and it was also played on Viva, which uh, they are not playing metal videos anymore. And that was, I mean, we were quite lucky that we got, to, got those uh, things played on MTV and Viva. Right. And, uh, so, uh... One thing that we really forgot to talk about is people know you, especially the Sri Lankans know you for the song, uh, this Nadi Ganga Tarane song, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's, uh, when did you record that song? Ah, uh, Chana, that was recorded in, uh, I came to Sri Lanka after I left Friends. I was, uh, I joined Court Jester. Then uh, I was not interested of listening to nightclubs. I never walked into nightclubs anymore because I lived my whole life playing music till about two, three o'clock in the morning. So I, I had a different life. I was working with Court Jester, like, uh, and we were playing underground metal gigs. I was, I was very, very happy with it. 1997, I came to Sri Lanka on vacation and I did a guest spot with my old band friends because I was asked to, from that hotel, Taj Samudra, asked to do a guest spot on the 31st night, uh, New Year's Eve. So I did that and that was sponsored by this uh, a brewery. Right. So then they asked me, they said, like, we have been looking for you because at that time we didn't have email, we didn't have, we don't have those kind of things, but we have today. We didn't have Zoom even. <laughs> so uh, somehow they got in touch with me and they insisted me to do this for them because they want to have my sort of a voice because they have been trying this, trying out with different, different people in Sri Lanka at that time. So they said nothing really captured them. So I took the complete responsibility and I said, okay, let me give it a try. So basically I would say that was my first ever Sri Lankan song. I never expected to be that successful, but somehow, I don't know, went off. That was really, really great. So. 
then I think, uh, I don't know, I'm just asking you a question because you're asking me questions. So did the music change in Sri Lanka after that? Yes. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's like the first ever, you know, Sinhalese rock song, I believe, right? There was no yes. other... <laughs> no, that's what everybody says, but I cannot say that, but you guys have to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I know that this song, uh, the, the melody is based on the Jimmy Clip song, right? Yes, it is based on the reason is, it was uh, used for the beer commercial because that time in Sri Lanka, we were able to uh, advertise uh, uh, alcohol on uh, on television or yeah. even in cinema uh, theaters, but uh, somehow in 2001 they stopped it. Uh, the reason for it, because this complete campaign of this advertising advertising campaign was done by an Australian company. Uh, so actually, the Australian people they asked me to do the Sinhalese version of this song. They gave me the complete context, they gave me the complete material, said that we need to have this song in Sinhalese lyrics. Mm. It's your responsibility. I said, okay. The reason is, because at that time, they were advertising Lion Beer in Sri Lanka, uh, but, but in Australia, sorry, uh, on TV. And the Australian version of Many Rivers to Cross was sung by Jimmy Barnes, the Australian singer. Right with that rough vibe, like my type of voice. So that's the reason, oh, then only I was thinking to myself, ah, okay, now I know, this is why they want me to do that, because I have that sort of vibe in my vocal. Uh, mm. So that's how, I, that's the reason uh, they took that song, Jimmy Clips one. Right, right. Yeah, I, I also remember that uh, there's a famous cover of from UB40 also that song, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I heard that UB40 cover, that was early 80s, I would say, 81, 82. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 th that was the album, uh, on the Labor of Love album of UB40, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, many rivers. I mean, many people have done this song, Joe Cocker. Uh, UB40, uh, Jimmy Barnes, Chitral Samapada. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in the world list, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So, so Chitty, also, you, you also recorded album with the, the British power metal band, Power Quest, right? Power Quest, yes. Uh, well, Steve and myself, we've been friends for a long time. And uh, in 2007, I joined... Uh, one of the uh, most new wave of British uh, heavy metal influence bands in Birmingham called Requiem. Mm. They have been existing since 1979. And their former members were, you must be known, I can't remember the name of the band, uh, Channa. Uh, Metallica's biggest influence was, who was this British, new wave of British heavy metal band? Uh, Ah, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Metallica always, they say in each and every interview, oh, well, we were influenced by this band. So actually, uh, the uh, Requiem, uh, the 1978 Mark I lineup was like two of these members were in the band. Right. So that was kind of, uh, kind of Black Sabbath, very doomish, very... So I really liked it. And then uh, the guitar player, uh, Paul, he called me up and he, he offered me this job. And uh, because he has been listening to many of some of the records where I've been. And so he decided, so, so I joined this band. Then I met Steve in UK. And uh, when we were playing on some love fest where we support Gothard, we played with, I uh, can't remember. There were loads of uh, British festivals. And uh, then I joined Power Quest. I did one record. I thought to myself, uh, it's, I mean, I have nothing against Power Quest, but 
I don't want to do those anthems anymore. <laughs> so then I, around 2012, uh, I got into composed music for movies and uh, because music is a very versatile thing, versatile thing. And uh, there are loads of things you could do. So I, I, I'm into it now. And I do a couple of things here and there. And uh, I do a lot of Sri Lankan stuff with a lot of rock influence. And then I have a new project, a bit called to action with Magnus Rosen and uh, two Brazilian musicians. Right. Uh, actually, we wanted to release something before COVID. COVID screwed us. <laughs> yeah. So you also released uh, the, this your solo album, which is more of uh, music, uh, composed music, right? The photographic yeah. breath. Yeah. Yes. Composed music. Exactly. This, this was released in 2012. And uh, while I was in PowerQuest, I was writing those stuff uh, uh, because uh, I have something to give it to even to a film uh, film director. Okay, this is, uh, this is my music because everybody thinks, everybody looks at me uh, in a way, oh, he's a singer and right. no one knows that I'm a composer. But my, my motto is, I'm a composer who sings. So I'm not a very, uh, I know that I have a special voice, uh, but I'm not the best singer in the world. I don't think they are the best singers, but I'm just one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chiti, one of the songs I really like, uh, I was like going through the YouTube, one of your songs is Land in Flames with uh, Civilization One. Yeah. Right? So when mm. was the Civilization One uh, formed? Uh, that was uh, right after Firewind. I formed that band together with uh, a heavenly bassist Pierre Emmanuel from France, mm. and then uh, we had three members from the Italian band Secret Spear, Aldo Nono Bile, and uh, Lu Luca. So the first album was really successful. With, uh, it was on Metal Heaven Records, right. and it was produced by Marcus Tesca from uh, Red Circuit. And uh, then the second one, uh, which was a bit different, and a lot of labels, they refused it because they were not able to finance it because we had a lot of, that was a time around 2008 where our label started, uh, record label, they started uh, reducing bands because of the financial crisis, because right. of the downloads and things were pirating, et cetera, et cetera. But in the same, me, I mean, I've been a member of Red Circuit since 2002. I've been working with Marcus very closely for a long, long time. He's an excellent producer, excellent musician, and an excellent human being. So we still, even all my Sri Lankan stuff, like even my single is uh, Singa Bumi, my first ever single is uh, record, was also produced by Marcus. And uh, most of my tracks are produced by Marcus Tesca, mixed by, I, I, I produce them, but he, the end, he does the right essence to it. Yeah. So uh, you you bring uh, Civilization One actually performed in Sri Lanka, right? Yes, that was under the influence of the former pres uh, pr former Prime Minister Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe's brother Niraj Vikramasinghe, right? The CEO of uh, TNL Radio, who want, who always uh, who was always influenced by rock music, and. and uh, so then I get, uh, uh, he, he called me and he asked me, Chiti, I'd like to have a foreign band to play on uh, TNL on stage. That was 2008. Right. We were successful. Then we played again in 2009. And uh, afterwards, I joined PowerQuest. And I disbanded because for me, uh, it was a financial crisis as well because I was looking looking for a, for a, a label, I did not find anything. I guess Calling the Gods album was re released on Limp Records around 2000, 
12, I suppose, yeah. yeah. Or oh, 14, I can't remember. So it took a long time for that release. Right. So uh, Land in Flames, uh, it's a great song. And uh, I did the music and the lyrics as well. And it's about cruel leaders in the world. That's exactly what's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All over the world. It's it's about dictators, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh I think one of the quite proud moments for Sri Lanka was when you performed with the Luxembourg Orchestra. Right? Yeah. Two thousand nine. I performed with them twice. Yeah. And uh that was I was very lucky. And uh I mean, uh, you must be knowing the band Dragon Force, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, Power Quest and Dragon Force has been all the time, they have been exchanging members, you know. <laughs> if you have been in Power Quest, you have been in Dragon Force. If you are in Dragon Force, you have been in Power Quest before. Right. So, we, uh, with, with the Blood Alliance album, we, we did a UK tour. We, we did uh, play in UK, uh, in England, uh, Scotland, and uh, in Wales. And then I met C.P. Thart, uh, the singer of, uh, former singer of Dragon Force. Uh, I mean, he's from South Africa, uh, South Africa. He's in Johannesburg, yes. And he came up with his funny British accent of English, um, South African accent. He said, hey, might, you know what? I'm bloody uh, jealous of you. I said, what? <laughs> the fuck are you performing with that fucking orchestra? I never got the chance. I don't think I'm that good enough to do that. <laughs> so that was a very good compliment as well so well I'm quite lucky that I got that chance because uh, that's where exactly I was uh, I got into film music and uh, 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 more of thinking of doing uh, very cinematic things uh, I learned when I was on stage while I was sing, singing, I was thinking to myself, well, more than singing, there are loads of other things which is interesting in music. Yeah. So that was, a, that was amazing. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> <laughs> so Chiti, you, uh, Similar to you, there, there are, I think there are very few Sri Lankans who has actually gone, uh, you know, to Europe and other places and been successful in music. Mm -hmm. There's one more other band that I know of is Jayashree. Yeah. Have you ever come across with Jayashree in Europe? Uh, we, we've done a couple of uh, European shows as well, but uh, mostly for the Sri Lankan communities. Right. And uh, well, there are a few more times, but they they don't uh, they don't publicize. For an example, at the London Symphonic Orchestra in the past, there was Rohan Desairam, right. Shelley, and uh, there are few, uh, not few. I think there are loads of Tamil ple uh, Tamil uh, Tamil people who went to UK, to France, and so on, and. Uh, they are in a lot of symphonic orchestras, so they have nothing to be commercial. Right. So they don't say that. Uh, uh, they want to uh, uh, tell Sri Lanka that they are playing in big orchestra or something. Another great influence is Jeffrey Hussain. Yes. Uh, Hussain Jeffrey has played with countless R&B uh, rhythm and blue artists, and uh, also he's 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 doing really well in the US in the jazz scene. And jazz is not commercial, rock is not commercial. And so this is the reason that people are not talking about us. <laughs> we are not the mainstream, main cream of the mainstream in Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah, um, I saw that you did, uh, because you talk about Jayashri. So I remember this YouTube video you did, you did a Chicken curry <laughs> for Rohan Jailat. <laughs> Rohan Ro Ro Jailat because he's allergic to uh, uh, the rest of the meat except chicken. So 
I did one for them. So here we go. <laughs> that was quite successful. Well, besides music, cooking is one of uh, is another thing which I love to do because it's also an art. Right. And uh, do you tend to like eat healthy? You are always conscious about that, uh, Chidi? Yes, very much. Very much because I like, I, uh, I mean, the food has to have some, some class, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, in a sense, like, uh, I like all sorts of food in the world. And uh, especially, I'm dying for Sri Lankan food. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Now in the Philippines, you you must be eating a lot of adobo and uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's normally the case. Adobo is like <laughs> you will eat at least once a week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, Philippines is a great country, and uh, I mean, Philippine musicians. Uh, I have worked with few Philippine musicians in the past, and they are great musicians. You get in Philippines, I and mean, like for an example, like Anil Pineda is sing of Journey. Yeah. I mean, I saw him live uh, on tour with Foreigner and man, he's just amazing. Only thing, some people, they say, they criticize, uh, oh, well, he's not Steve Perry. I said, okay, you know what? If you want to see Steve Perry, take a, uh, uh, take a magazine or take a picture of Steve Perry and close your eyes and listen to Anil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like he is. I mean, he sounds great, excellent. Yeah, I, I am. I've seen him many times actually, and I met him a couple of times. Uh -huh. he's very down to earth, also. Very, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He has very, you know, sort of a very uh, humble upbringing, upbringing, and he's uh, is very, very good with the fans actually. Uh -huh. yeah. Is he living in Philippines or is? Yes, he's, he's actually based in the Philippines. Oh, okay. Yeah, he does his solo stuff. Uh, uh, he was, we had him on our show because I actually have a part, I a guest host on a radio show here. Mm -hmm. So we had Arnold uh, also on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward one day to perform in, Fili in the Philippines uh, with one of the formations of what I, what I have right now. And uh, let's see, because uh, uh, Sasha Gessner, the guitarist of Halloween, is a very good friend of mine. Right. And he told me, oh, well, Chidi, here we play in, with Halloween. We play here in front of about 800, 900, 2,000 people maximum. But he said, like, when they used to play in Indonesia, they used to fill up all the stadiums. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, Halloween had a show last year, actually, in Malaysia. Ah, okay. Yeah, they had a very good show, the Pumpkin United tour. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, they had a big show. Um, so, J Chiti, I want to ask you about, uh, you did a tribute album. Uh, you released your parents' songs uh, yes. as a tribute album, right? Yeah. So, I I was listening to some of those songs and I, I it really brings me back to that uh, old days when I was watching that on TV. And uh, and then when you sing about Dambulu Gale, it's I remember going to Dambulla, you know, like for the first time way uh -huh. back when I was in school. Wow. Uh, <laughs> because I mean, uh, one thing with me is I I've always appreciated the music, whether it's it whether it was Sinhalese music, whether it was pop music, rock music, hip hop music. I didn't really care about the genre. It, it always about the feeling that I got or memories that attach to that song is really what mm. when I he, hear that song, I remember that feeling I had that first time I listened to it or, mm -hmm. you know, what, what situation I was on. So can you tell me about recording this uh, tribute album after, I think you recorded it in 2018, right? Uh, 2018, yeah. I released it in 2018. I recorded it in 2017. Uh, the reason for me to do this, because still, uh, well, I, I did a couple of tours uh, since uh, 2012. 
I started, uh, I thought to myself, okay, let me do something for our own people, our own communities who are living outside of Sri Lanka. So I got these opportunities to go and perform for them. And, and then they insisted me, uh, Chitra, we've been big fans of your parents' music. We would also like to see you singing those songs because you know what? We never get the chance to go that often to Sri Lanka and we still have those CDs here. We all, else we ask somebody who's coming, uh, uh, going to Sri Lanka and coming back here to bring, a, uh, uh, bring us some music like that. So that would be nice if you could really perform some of these stuff in front of uh, us. So I did that. The first opportunity for me was uh, Delana on Delana TV. They did this uh, Dell Studio. Right. So they, I was on the fifth episode and I didn't know exactly. So I gave them a list of songs, my songs uh, for them. Uh, to the producer, okay, this is what I'm going to perform. And I asked this guy, Mahesh Denipitiya, to rearrange that. Then Mahesh called me up. He said, like, no, we are going to only to take two songs from you and the rest of the songs is going to be your parents' songs because people need to listen to them. So I agreed and I did this. Then I thought to myself, okay, let me select at least 10 or 12 songs and uh, release uh, uh, some of the some of these songs, I mean, these are songs basically speaks about the beauty of Sri Lanka and the history. Yeah. So uh, after so many years, I've been in the professional music business for about almost thirty seven years, and uh, now I started releasing it. And I hope. Let me ask you a question. I hope. It sounded great on your ears. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's why I said, because it really uh, brings me back. When I, whenever I listen to that, it brings me back to, uh, like, you know, I remember watching that your mother and father play, singing it on TV. Yeah, yeah, and, sure. Uh, that's the memory I have. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I remember that as well. So, uh, so I didn't change anything. I did not modernize. I just kept the same arrangement and the same vibe. And it's just a uh, cover version with my, vo with my voice range, uh, which is really, I mean, like, as I said to you, like on the 22nd, I'm performing here for, for a uh, Sri Lankan community for 50 people. And most of them, they said like, please, we need to listen to your parents' songs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it goes. So Chiti, recent, uh, you have done a lot of songs with, uh, I, I've been watching your Singhali songs, the new songs. Most of those songs seems to be very deep. Uh, with a with, with a very strong message, and you're trying yeah. to do. Uh, uh, I know there's a lot of songs, but one song that is really I've been uh, wanted to ask you is about Vilpattu, is the song you wrote about the Vilpattu, right? So, and recently I think in 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 Voice Sri Lanka they they played that on the grand finale also, right? That song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what what triggered you to do that song? Well, Tanner, I'm a rock musician. Rock musicians are, they are revolutionary people, right? Right. <laughs> we always stand for the correct thing. So when this, situ when this thing happened in Sri Lanka, when they started cutting uh, trees at the Vilpatua, and uh, I'm a person, I'm a nature lover. I don't like anybody Anywhere in this world, if somebody is destroying the nature, that means he's not a human being. He's somebody else. He's from a different planet. Right. So in that case, because I'm an animal lover, I'm a nature lover, and uh, I always, I mean, when I was a music teacher, when I used to teach way back in Germany, uh, I've been influencing even my students to do the right thing. So 
I was just thinking to myself, such a big chaos is going on in Sri Lanka with this Vilpato and some people are, uh, I mean, they are protesting, they are uh, going on the streets and politicians, they, 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 they were not doing anything. Right. I mean, it was done by these politicians for their own benefits. So in that case, I was okay. I was thinking to myself. Then I spoke to this lyric writer Chintan Ramadasa, and uh, he said, "Okay, you know what? I've got an idea. Let's send a message across with music rather than just having an interview on the, in the newspaper or whatever." Right. So somehow we released this song. Mm, that was in 2016, I, I can't remember, uh, no, it was before that. And uh, so that was a good message. Some people, they understood this message and some people, they, they uh, I mean, the information went through their veins. Uh, but then nobody spoke about this anymore. I mean, like there is a saying, uh, Sri Lankans will always remember for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, then, this young fellow who sang on these voice teens, uh, and I did go, I, I did a comment on uh, his YouTube uh, saying that, uh, that he really impressed me doing that song because uh, it's quite rare to right. uh, see people singing my songs on these voice teams and so on. So, uh, I mean, like, it's, it's a great uh, feeling for me to see young people are really getting influenced by myself because that's a very good thing. Hmm. And then uh, I did see some, uh, some comments. Wow, I, I, we thought that this, is, this, is, this uh, uh, is one of his own songs. But now we are listening to the original <laughs> of Chitral song, <laughs> which was which was quite funny, <laughs> in a way. Like I mean, like it was not played on radio. I mean, like a couple of times they played when it came out, and uh, but I don't know. So I'm um, like I said, Chandra, I'm into that kind of revolutionary thing. I don't like unfair things when things are happening like that. I'm always standing by yeah because uh, as you said rock music metal music is about that right revolution yeah alien. see you take any metal album or uh, you take uh, i mean you take iron maiden you take ronnie james dio you uh, you take black sabbath you take anything it's all about human rights yes and people who say uh, bad things about metal <sighs> I think they're out of this world. <laughs> yeah, so because uh, they're always like, people always seems to, I don't know, I mean, probably the the perception has changed over the years, but, you know, yeah. people were judged when you were like, you know, if you look like a metal head, if you had long hair or whatever. Yeah, it, was yeah. always, it was, there was always judgment, right? Back in the day, in yeah. the country, it was like, that's, yeah. the, that's the reason I really didn't want to go, go back <laughs> to Sri Lanka because, you know, I really, I really, there was something always, when I was growing up, mm. something was missing for me there. So, mm. you know, I was, I, we couldn't, uh, I, so fulfill and then, but I, now I find that it's, it's all, all these things that we can do with music and, you know, these events and all these things that, that is around rock music and stuff. So, uh, yeah. So Chidi, you, you, uh, although you, you were abroad, but you, you have a, you have a very good connection with Sri Lanka. You always go there. So can yeah. you, can you tell me your uh, view about the the music scene in general in Sri Lanka, what do you see? Is it is it uh, is it going in the right direction? Uh, or and also about the metal scene, a little bit about the metal scene in Sri Lanka. Uh, the, about the metal scene in Sri Lanka, I mean there are great new influences coming up, and uh, but they have to. I, I, I've been talking to a few of them, and I've told them, listen. All but you still need to get to uh, you need to learn about 
constructive criticism. If somebody criticizes you, right. accept that. I mean, Channa, in, uh, for an example, in Sweden or in the whole of Europe, metal, is, metal has become a culture. Yes. They live with it. They, I mean, like if my, 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 my neighbor, for an example, my, my neighbor must be different. But if I'm dressed like this, if I have long hair or whatever, my neighbor don't care about that. They know that this man is living. Mm. So in Sri Lanka, I mean, they have cornered the metal sector uh, somewhere there and they are not really looking at it. Actually, before COVID, I was talking to one of the TV stations because I have a lot of big influence. I could really bring it up. And I was talking to a radio station, uh, not a radio station, a TV station, saying that I would really like to host a program and bring these people and ask them about their thoughts. I mean, we need to support them. But... Uh, in Sri Lanka, I would say it's a great country with bad influences. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing has changed so far. I hope things will change in the, in the future. Mm. That's exactly what I wish. That people will open their ears to listen to quality, good music, like you want to eat quality, food, quality good food. And... Uh, so, well, there are a few metal bands that are coming up and the uh, thing is they're getting too frustrated because they have no resources and they have no opportunities uh, to show their talents. Yeah. yeah. So for that, the big musicians who are in the music industry, they have to think of genres. We need to bring in genres, rock, pop, jazz, to metal, to everything. Right. And I think it's also a problem in our education system. I've been talking to one of these education ministers once. I said like, sir, may I talk to you for a second? Yes. I've told him, could you please do me a favor? Could you make Western music as a subject in every school? This may lead into different talents, Channa. Right. right. You see, for an example, what has happened to me, I went to Isipatana Mahavidyala, now they call it college. And I never took music into my subject. Do you know why? Because I didn't want to learn this Hindustani boring music. <laughs> if that would have been Western music, okay. <laughs> If uh, I always wanted to learn it, that would have been, okay, people could learn guitar, people could learn violin, people, you can make an orchestra. I mean, like, uh, I don't know which school you, was, you studied at, Royal College. No, I studied in Nigambo. Ah, okay. So, I performed uh, two years ago with the Royal College uh, uh, Orchestra. And they were great. Right. They were great. I was so happy. And they were little boys. Like they're like 15, 16 years old. And it was fantastic. Myself and Umara, we performed. Our uh, big hit, Malakut Tibuna. And then I was doing uh, one of my difficult songs. And those guys, they were able to do that. And I was really surprised. When I went to the rehearsal, I asked the band leader, uh, so, Puta, uh, what song? What, what are the songs you have selected? Manusara. I said, what? Are you able to play that? Yeah, we, we, we practiced. Okay, go ahead. So, I didn't want to discourage them. Well, there, there were a few things here and there, but I don't care about that. At least they had the courage to do that. And they impressed me, John, believe me. And this was a... Great thing. So that's compliment to the Saga, Saga Orchestra of uh, Royal College. Right. Yeah. So I mean, like in Sri Lanka, simply what I have to say, we have talent. 
it's up to the media now. Mm. Right. <clears throat> So, uh, so Chitty, uh, so you have a show coming up 22nd August and uh, yeah. can you tell me also what, what can we expect from you for the rest of the 2020? <laughs> the rest of the 2020, uh, uh, right at the moment, the big things, uh, I mean like the bigger concerts, I'm sure because of COVID-19, it won't take place. Right. So, myself and Magnus, we decided, uh, Magnus Rosen, former Hammerfall bass player. So we decided uh, to do some live performances in some. We, we want to do some pub gigs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, there are normal people who are listening to, who would love to listen to us. So we thought of doing a ride around, ride across Sweden, a little tour like that, a pub gig tour. Myself and Magnus, I'm on acoustic guitar and vocals, Magnus on bass. And whatever he wants, he can sing too. <laughs> but I know that he won't because he can't. <laughs> so that's exactly what you could expect from me in 2020. And in the meantime, I'm writing new stuff in my studio here. And uh, so let's see. I'm, I'm quite positive and I hope you, you are positive as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> Very good. So, Chiti, message to a message to people who listen to Chit your songs, your parents' songs, and you know, been supporting you. <laughs> yes, my dear friends, please be positive and don't get discouraged because of COVID nineteen. Everything's gonna be good. Yeah. Anybody you want to shout out to Chiti? Anybody you want to shout out? I hear someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Chitty, thank you for doing this. Uh, no problem. Session. I'm sorry that, uh, uh, like, uh, I misplaced the dates. <laughs> 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 but it's okay the, I mean really enjoy it. I mean I've, I've been a fan of you for so long I've been knowing you for a long, long time so I wanted to really have this talk and uh, I really enjoy doing this uh, so I'm looking forward to more music from you and then you know someday I can see you live uh, sure. so, so tell everyone how they can follow you on social media yes Everyone you can uh, hook me up on Facebook. That my Facebook site is facebook.com slash Somapala. That's my fan site. And uh, just type in Chitral Somapala. And also, please try and subscribe my YouTube channel. It's uh, youtube.com slash photographic breath. Right. So, and uh, you guys, so don't feel, uh, I mean, like, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. You can always go to my website, sompala.com, and drop me a message. I'm definitely going to reply to you as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean, we are having this discussion because of that, right? I sent you a message and you responded. So I wasn't yeah. expecting you would respond, but... <laughs> I always do that. I always do that. And it was very interesting for me also to do some, something like this, Channa. I have to tell you this. I have to congratulate you as well, because... Uh, uh, for a long time, I did not do a interview uh, right. or a chat like this with a metal-oriented person, and uh, so now you see, I have, I have even forgotten which bands I have been on tour. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're doing a great job with your website because your website is very detailed. You keep track of all these albums and bands and everything, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but I need to do that more. But uh, in the audience, if there is someone a good webmaster, please contact me because I'm looking for a new one. <laughs> so, uh, so Chiti, uh, so have a great day. So thank you, you. Shana, I mean, thank you, Shana. You have a nice Sunday, okay? Thank you. Take care, brother. Okay. Bye, boy. Bye, boy. Okay. Take care. God bless.